Um, my name is Tiffany Hall, and I'm going to just kind of um, give you an idea of how <clears throat> we in Utah sort of started this, and how I spent two years of my life hoping that I wasn't going to go to jail before I met Kathleen and Alan, and I figured out on a state level how to make open educational resources and get it work for us. So, sorry. We started with uh, a research project um, about two years ago in Utah, looking at science texts using open resource. We weren't 100% uh, convinced that the textbooks that teachers had in their high school classes were sufficient. Um, we were hearing a lot that they were really big, that they used them on the shelf, and that you know maybe once or twice they would reference them, but, but they weren't 100% um, user-friendly or student-friendly. And if you've seen them, they're all also very large and very heavy and fill up the backpack, and they're also very expensive. So we put together a research project. We started with about 15 teachers. We ended up with about nine teachers, where we went and created a science textbook using open educational uh, resources using a website called CK12, which is a foundation that has been focusing on science and math, vetted resources for uh, high school and, and middle school students. So we put this book together, and we were working with four different districts. We had teachers in four different districts, and we were just not sure how the idea of open educational resources was going to play with school boards how it was going to play with teachers, or how it was going to play with students, and especially how it was going to play with parents. I don't know how you are in your states, but in our states, if parents aren't happy with the textbook, they will let us know through the board, it ends up on the front page of the newspaper, it gets, you know, it, it, it's very, very public what happens. So we, we brought these teachers together and started to put together um, these textbooks and discovered that we had two different models that happened. One was a girl model and one was a boy model. And I hate to be gender specific about it, but that's really how it worked. We had um, our female teachers edited the heck out of these books and came up with about a 250 page textbook. Um, and the gentleman in our group just took everything that was available, ended with about a 1200 page book, and said that they would edit as they went through the year. So we had these two models, but we put them out there and decided we'd see what it looked like. Long story short, there's another presentation later today about the project in detail. Um, we found many things to be very, very positive. We found that teachers felt very empowered, that they used every page of the textbook, um, that students liked very much having access to open educational resource textbooks because they were available online. Um, they could get to them from their homes. We also, uh, through some grant funding, provided some print copies of the books that students were able to actually take home and write in. And um, we found that we, we were receiving some very good feedback from students and parents. We had a couple of issues uh, that we needed to be aware of, and I'm just going to talk about a couple of things that we found um, as we started putting these together and using them in schools. And the first one, was that everybody is so busy, we really needed to get better at quality control. Um, we had one textbook that we printed with the teacher's name, who was the teacher of the class, spelled incorrectly. That was the first year. The second year, we spelled it on the front of the textbook. We spelled her name correctly, but we misspelled the word chemistry. So you know, just little things like that, um, we, need, we discovered that there really are issues um, with our own credibility. We knew that content was good, um, but we had pages where stuff would run off the end of the page or where maybe the formatting wasn't perfect. So that, that using these resources, we need to remember that if they are reflecting us as educators, that they need to be um, very, very good. Um, we, we know that the printing, when we were able to print, wasn't in color, but we were able, of course, to link electronically, so a lot of those resources that came up um, were fine. Oh, it went away. Um, this is, sorry, this is Brian, <coughs> one of our teachers, and he has his uh, book um, in Utah. This is our UEN, Utah Education Network uh, page, and they all have it. If you just click that, his first semester um, biology book, there it goes. Yeah. Oh, it's having some maintenance right now. Another one of those small issues with a lot of electronic stuff, but we know that. Um, but uh, we also discovered that as we worked with teachers, they would often, um, you know, be concerned with, with parent perception of how these books were being used. And so one day I was sitting at a football game at, at this high school with, where this teacher teaches, and the, I don't know if, if 
all of your football fields are set up like this, but the home side is always the side where the sun is not in your eyes. And so since we only really just care to cheer when my stepson kicks the ball, which happens like once a game, um, we were sitting on the home side and not on the visitor side. And so I was sitting next to some parents, and so, of course, because I'm nosy, I just said, oh, so do you have children at the school? Yes. Well, who do they have for science? Oh, they have Mr. Blake. And I said, really? How is Mr. Blake as a teacher? Oh, he's fabulous. My kids have a book that they can write in. Actually, our youngest son has a book that he can write in. It's just like he's in college. He's learning so much. It's so much better. How come my other kids didn't have this? And I said, well, I actually know the answer to that question. <laughs> it was um, very interesting to hear the positive reception, despite the fact that you know words were spelt wrong or, or things weren't perfect, the idea that parents were so open to this idea that we were providing additional options and ways, both electronically and print, for students to access immediately accessible and scientifically valid and reliable um, resources. Our fear through this whole process was, of course, that um, we hadn't gone through all of the right channels. And so that's how come we started to work with Alan and Kathleen with this project, so that we could figure out the right way as a state to begin to adopt open educational resources and be able to use them without a fear of going to jail um, you know, for, for doing anything untoward. So. Um, my, I'm Alan Griffin. I work with the uh, instructional materials recommendation process. It used to be called textbook adoptions, but we've changed the name to instructional materials recommendation. Uh, I also work with a group called NASTA, which is the National Association of State Textbook Administrators. Um, and I've been kind of crafting with them the evolution of all these new materials, particularly with digital materials. And uh, my concern, and sometimes I feel like I'm the boat anchor holding everything back, but I guess my concern is to make sure that we have really valid, high quality content materials um, in our schools. And uh, I've known Tiffany for about three weeks. I've known Kathy for considerably longer. But uh, as we went through the process of trying to decide what to do with digital materials and now open education materials, it's brought, you know, we've had to think about a whole bunch of new things. Because typically when we adopt a textbook, uh, you know, we have the publisher send us samples and we go through the samples and we have a list of, of core objectives that we try to match it up with and, and you know we consider things like the quality of the binding and the print on the page and all kinds of things like that. Well now we have uh, open education resources being used by schools and of course my initial question was have they been through my process? My process is the best. You know, they've been through our, my evaluation <coughs> process and uh, we kind of throw the doors open here and say Teachers can get resources from anywhere they want, or should they be validated? And so we're, we're trying to wrestle with a reasonable process for validation. And so uh, when Tiffany uh, came into the office, and in connection with Kathy, we talked about uh, open educational resources. Typically, a publisher is a champion of their book. And they will come and market it. They will come and push it out to me and, uh, you know, tell me that it needs to be reviewed and we review it and all those kinds of things. Open Education Resources, who's the champion? You know, there isn't a, a salesman that comes to, to sell it. There isn't somebody who pushes it. Well, does that mean that I should go out and solicit it? I'm a little apprehensive to do that because I deal with all the publishers as well. So, one of the initial questions was, who's going to be the contact for the open educational resources uh, to see that they get into the schools. Otherwise, you know, we've got the publishers and the free market system, they're not anxious, anxious to make a buck, and so they will go out and actively market it. Uh, open educational resources are not that way. Another uh, difficulty is, uh, how do you validate the, the quality of the curriculum? You know, who is the validation, I mean, should we, uh, should we pull in a bunch of university professors and get them to validate it? Should we, should we just rely on the publishers because they have an economic interest in it? They will validate it. Well, open educational resources, nobody has an economic interest, so you know, how, how do we go there? Or should we just let Google do it? You know, we just say, well, who, who's using it the most? 
payment to her, but we'll validate it that way. Well, we wrestled with all these issues, and we came up with five areas, and I've got, I've got handouts if, for, for uh, some of you if you'd like, for the five general areas that NASTA and myself are looking at to evaluate digital materials, and I think probably they're going to apply just as well to uh, open education resources. Things like the content, the equity and accessibility. You know, I've heard that talked about a number of times today. But in public education, we want a resource that everybody can get to. Everybody can get to, and there's no restriction necessarily on the type of device you're using. Uh, how is it assessed? What are the teacher helps? You know, if it requires technical expertise, who do you go to? Well, once again, we have the open education community. Does it need technical expertise or not? Uh, and then design and support. And, you know, we kind of rate them on, on a little scale there. Uh, at this point in time, we, we went ahead, and uh, because one district we knew was using some of these open educational resources, we allowed them to be the champion and said to them, send us the resource if you find resources that you like that are open educational resources. Send it to us, and we will evaluate them the same way we evaluate all the other textbooks. In other words, we're putting them in competition with the Pearson, Prentice Hall, with the McGraw-Hill, and all those others and saying to them, you need to meet the same, same standard, which is probably only fair, you know. But understanding that, they're a unique kind of uh, instrument because open education resources are designed to be adaptable so that teachers can, can change them and use them as they will. So our, evaluator, our evaluators need to understand that this is a different animal than what is sent to us by a publisher as well. So we went through the process, we got a teacher committee to evaluate them, we put them on our database. It's a starting point. I don't know how well they're going to do. I mean, the reviews are not sterling in comparison with other kinds of resources, but the fact that they're very cost effective, you know, uh, they're essentially free, uh, makes a big difference to teachers. So that's kind of where I went with it. Now I'm going to turn over time to Kathy and talk to you about uh, her perspective on the issue. Okay, so the question is, what's a book? What They took uh, a digital book that was created from the California Open Project, and then they created a subdivision of it, and then they actually printed it. So we recognize that's a book, and it's just content. And what they added I to the book, right. they added <laughs> <laughs> they added some of their own review questions, vocabulary terms. So they took the content that right. came from a, a great pub, a great resource and customized it and made it themselves. And because it was put into paper, it was a book, so we understand what a book is. But what is a book in this digital age? How many of you have uh, initiatives in your state where they're doing one-to-one, -one, where they're having every kid in a classroom have a digital device? Any of you have that going on in your states? A few of you do? Okay. So in the context of what's coming with education, what's a book? I'm the, uh, one of the jobs that I have is I'm principal of the Utah Electronic High School, which is uh, the state virtual high school that's been around for 17 years in Utah. And uh, we pay teachers to develop curriculum for all of their classes. And then, because first of all, there wasn't anything to license back when we started. And second of all, we have the lowest uh, funding per pupil in the nation and have for years, so we can't afford to pay ongoing licensing fees. So we had our teachers develop the curriculum. Is that a book? So uh, we don't have a regular classroom teacher put their syllabus through Alan's process. Should we have to have an online teacher put it through the process? So let me show you real quickly what it is we've got. This uh, link right here takes you to a page that, this is a back end page. Back in 2009, we released our entire curriculum with the Creative Commons license uh, three. And this is the back end page that will take you to all of the content that we have. And uh, this isn't something, that, it's not a beautiful, pretty page yet. So, uh, but as you scroll down through here, you can see uh, all the different classes. And we teach our classes by quarter. And uh, right here is financial literacy. So if you click on that link, it comes, uh, uh, it pulls a database view of the content for that first quarter class of all the notes that we have in the class. If you go to this view, which is what I'm going to take you to, that takes you to the, uh, all of the content for the first quarter. And then as you scroll down through it, 
Uh, that's all the content that a, a student would have. So our question is, is this a book and should it be, should it have to go through the, the textbook adoption process? Well, we've also been thinking a lot about these mobile devices and how kids are coming to school with these devices, whether we're supplying them or not. And do we need to put this in a, in a format that's more accessible for them? So back in 2009, we, we had been, how many of you are blackboard lovers? Users. <laughs> I didn't say users, I said lovers. Oh, well, 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 well. <laughs> you okay. go on the other continuum? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so, well, so we were in Blackboard, and, and like I said, we've been around for a while, and we bought Blackboard back when it was 1.0 kind of thing, and, and, and at that time it was like $8,000, and then it went to $108,000 a year, and it was like, so, and like I said, we're poor, so we made the strategic decision that we wanted to move away from Blackboard and we moved into Moodle. What, would, what had happened for us in developing our content, it was locked inside the learning management system. And it was nested hell. Because we had one class, the teacher had designed it, that it seriously took seven clicks before you could get to the first thing in the class because it was so nested. And uh, so we made the decision that when we moved from Blackboard to Moodle, we were going to separate the content from the learning management system. So if you go to the front page of our class, one of our classes, let's see if I've got this right here. Hopefully I haven't logged, it hasn't logged me out. This is what our, inside our Moodle system looks like. And uh, this right here, this is, all of our classes are divided into these four sections. And we have, this is just information about the class. And then each one of these is a link into a unit that's out on our content server. When we separated the content from the learning management system, it, it made it so that anybody could go see that without having to log into our class. And then, of course, the kids turn in their assignments and stuff down here, and uh, links to their proctor tests and stuff are inside the learning management system, but the content is outside of it. So now that we have the content outside of it, what's the next step? And for us, the idea was, well, we need to create it in an uh, EPUB or other kinds of accessible ways for kids to, to access it using their mobile, their mobile devices. So we've been playing around with creating EPUB documents. So there's a place online called EPUB Bud that uh, it's just a website that you can take and cut and paste and put stuff into it and then at the end on this website it'll kick out an EPUB document. So we have, uh, this is a place where we post some of the content, uh, the media device uh, resources that our teachers create. We've also added a link to the EPUB versions of our <coughs> web page. And so as our content has evolved over time, then we'll kick out new EPUB documents. Uh, we needed a process that was quick, so we tried pages and then this EPUB bud. And the EPUB bud, even though it's not as pretty as the pages, EPUB uh, kick out, it works pretty well. So our thought is once we get this process down pretty well, we're going to submit our uh, EPUB documents and see what happens. So we'll see if, if it gets good comments or not, not so good comments. So great. <laughs> great. So we would like to have some conversation. What do you think? Questions, comments? Back in the back and then up here. Uh, I have a question for Alan. You said that you, uh, as you're going through the vetting process of these textbooks, that they, they didn't get sterling recommendations, the OER textbooks. Could you elaborate more? Well, we pull in a committee of teachers and uh, district specialists to evaluate the textbooks. Okay, and so they go through them, and number one, they compare them with the core curriculum to make sure all the core objectives are, are covered. And then they evaluate them on the basis of. Uh, things like uh, does it engage the student well and those kinds of things. Most of the, uh, the books that we have seen at this point are content and they're made there and they're, they're designed to be adaptable for uh, teacher use and student use. But what, what's happened, I mean our evaluators are used to seeing a student edition, a teacher edition. Glossy and in color. Yeah, uh, CDs, DVDs, all kinds of ancillary materials, bins full of stuff. I mean, publishers send us an, an extreme amount of stuff. And so they, they're used to seeing all this glossy stuff that 
goes into, and I'm not saying the name is bad, I mean it's wonderful stuff, but they're used to seeing all these teacher helps, and now what we're seeing is, here is content, and the content we feel pretty good about is valid, I mean they looked at the content and said it was pretty good, but didn't feel like, you know, a teacher could pick it right up and go right into a course with it, it's not evolved to that stage yet, the teacher needs to have some expertise in going through and focusing on the content and then adding his own whatever else that needs to go with it. I think it was mainly because there just weren't enough materials that went with it that it just didn't look like the other kind of content. And part of that was how they were developed. Um, when they were developed, we asked the districts to give us their very best teachers um, because that was one of the, the vetting processes for us. Those of us who were working on it, we weren't science teachers. And so we said, we want your best science teachers. And so when you get that, you get the, the <coughs> teachers who already have their lectures ready and they really just created a book that was a support to the student, not to the teacher. Um, another thing that they did is that they put their common formative assessments that they developed uh, in as part of that or quizzes and lectures, or quizzes for their lectures that they had in place. But again, it was very, very much driven to support what they already knew that they were doing in the classroom, not to um, support a new teacher. If you were a new teacher coming in to teach biology for the first time, and I handed you Brian's 250-page book, um, you might struggle with that just a little bit because he has another set of files on his computer that, that govern his content and what, what is taught in class and how his labs and activities work. So what so we think we really might do is it. take the full one that CK-12 does and submit that to his process and then, because that's much richer, and then we'll see where we go from that. And then know that that would be the teacher edition of the book and then the student edition would be Mr. Blake's where he pulls out and adds to. There was one more comment question. Um, actually, uh, something separately to both of you. As you were speaking, a thought I had in realizing as you acknowledged that it's a different animal as we look at this new environment and to use the old criteria doesn't fit it well if you've got a restaurant and you have a connoisseur judge it but you can go next door and there's a free vegetable garden. Your criteria for the restaurant and the you know, culinary experience, you stand in the vegetable garden and you ask, scrap this, we've got to deal with something brand new here. Um, and just one thought based, not I've obviously got no insight to your environment, so this comment might be misdirected, but it might be useful. Is I found I'm from Wisconsin, and in our environment, where we've got a bureaucratic, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, a bureaucratic in, uh, institutional way of evaluating materials, that often you find that there's a bit of a dissonance at times between the evaluators and the teachers themselves of how they think about it. And, and that to me is uh, you know, traditional. And I think to, uh, a new way would be to validate both and let that, and, and, and not let the bureaucratic one be the final vote, because that's also traditional. But uh, make sure that uh, that harmony is created. Because sometimes you have teachers who say, yes, 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 it's not there. When you pay people, they do that for you, but we do it ourselves, and we really engage, and kind of like, I get into the vegetable garden, I chop the uh, zucchini myself, it's not a problem. Um, instead of saying, how was the zucchini presented? You know, um, um, and where, where you can, Bridge that, you know, uh, variation. And then a quick question for you: When you split the LMS mm -hmm. and your content, mm -hmm. do you have regular people provide uh, dump the content there, or do you have some people that are um, is whose job it is to put the stuff in? It's a cut for content our uh, teachers did, and so there's some feedback. So the but teachers not really. find it easy to to work with the content environment. It, yeah, it works out. It works out okay. They're standing up because we're standing up with you at the lunch. So if you'd like to continue the conversation, we'd be happy. We'll be here for a little bit. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.